Amen. Well, good to see everybody. Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 14. And we started Mark 14 last week. It's a, it's a really long chapter. And so we'll see how much we can get through today. Um, well, let's pray one more time. Lord, as we open our Bibles, we invite your Holy Spirit to teach us. And just would ask that you would uh, use this time to really speak to us, Lord, and, 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 and do a, a work in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've talked about how this, um, in chapter 14, this is Passover week in Jerusalem. And remember on the 10th day of, of, of the month during Passover, um, lambs all over the city were brought into the homes and to examine them, to see if they were without spot, to see if they were without uh, blemish. And Jesus' um, examination began really at the exact same moment as the Passover lambs were being brought into these homes. And our text indicates that in verse 12 here, we've come to the day of the Passover lambs that they would be killed. It would have been the 14th day of Nisan. And so look at verse 12 of Mark 14. It says, now, on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? So now just really quick, sometimes this causes confusion because we're going to see Jesus. He has this meal with his disciples at night, and then it would be the next day, and then he would be crucified. And how is this the same day? The answer, I think, comes in how Jewish people look at a day. You know, in the, the Western world, we measure our day from midnight to the next midnight, right? 24 hours to 24 hours. And, um, and that works for us, and that's good. Um, but the Jewish people, they saw their day from sundown to sundown. And so a little different, right? So as Jesus is having the Passover meal... The Jewish day, the 14th day of Nisan, just begun. And he would be crucified around 3 p.m. the next day. And so as our thinking goes, you know, in the, you know, in the Jewish mind, it's still the same day. Um, so I, sometimes I get asked this question a lot. And so, you know, Jesus, again, he was crucified on Friday, right? And he rose to the grave on Sunday. And so the, the thing is, how do we get three days, Right? How do you get three days? Well, again, from the Jewish day, from sundown to sundown, um, at, at, at any part of that day is considered the day. And so Jesus was crucified and buried before sundown on Friday, and then sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, day two, and once the sun went down on Saturday night, it was the third day. And so if I've confused you more, I apologize. Um, but, but just to understand that, from sundown to sundown, right? And so our text this morning, we look at this last really night of Jesus, his earthly ministry. And so to, to the Jewish mind, the first, it's the first few hours of his last day. And so this morning, we're going to see these events transpire. And, and what we're going to see is these, these different locations that Jesus is at. And each of these locations, there's, there's really a great lesson for us to learn. And, and so... Uh, the, the night, the first, this final night where we see him in his, Jesus in his ministry, he's in the upper room. And look at verse 13. It continues and it says, As he sent the two of his disciples, he said to them, Go into the city and a man will be, meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Whatever he goes in, wherever he goes in and say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And so his disciples went out and they came to the city and found it just as he said to them. And they prepared the Passover. And so this, again, the final night of Jesus' ministry begins in this upper room. And Jesus set this whole thing up and he tells his disciples to go into the city of Jerusalem. And he tells them to follow a man carrying a pitcher of water. And understand in those days, now only women would have carried a pitcher of water uh, around. 
And so the people wonder how, you know, they, how would they know which man to follow, you know? Well, it would be like saying today, maybe a man carrying a purse. Actually, maybe that's not a good analogy, but, but you know, it would have been unique is what I would say. You know, it, it, it would have been very unique. And so Jesus says that, that a man go into that house, and that's where we're going to eat the Passover meal. You know, church history records that the upper room where Jesus and his disciples met. Now, history, it doesn't tell us this, that this was Mark's parents' house. That's what history tells us, and, and we don't know for sure. But it's kind of interesting to think about. I mean, Mark, the very, the very author of the book that we're reading, his parents. And, and so maybe, maybe they were. Maybe, you, you know, this the tradition, church tradition tells us this. But, you know, since the time of Exodus, God told the Jewish people to have this feast, the Passover, right? Why? On the 14th day of Nisan to remember what God did in Egypt. You know, it, you know remember, they were slaves in Egypt, and he sent the death angel to pass over those who didn't have the blood of the lamb above their doorpost in their home, the angel passed Passed over, they, they, the angel passed over, but if you didn't have the blood, that firstborn would die. And so the, the Jews, ever since then, they celebrate Passover. And this, was, this is what Jesus and his disciples were doing. Look at verse 17. It continues and it says, In the evening he came with the twelve. Now, as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Surely I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and say to him, one by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? And he answered and said to them, it is one of the twelve who dips with me in this dish. And the Son of Man indeed goes just as is written of him, but woe to the man of whom the Son of Man is betrayed it would have been good for that man if he were never been born. In John's gospel, it makes it clear that they were laying around this table in traditional Jewish style. And John's gospel tells us, it gives a kind of a seating chart for us. And it tells us that, you know, John, he, he, he's on the chest of Jesus and Jesus, Jesus is leaning on the chest of, of Judas and I just think, you know, when I read that, I think, you know, Jesus, you know, he gave so many opportunities to Judas to repent, to turn, to go a different direction. You know, as, as I mean, Jesus, he washed the disciples' feet as they entered the house. You know, he, he was serving them and, and, and including Judas. But is this meal, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And everyone said, is it I? It's kind of interesting. Without anyone, you know, you know, Judas could have whispered, I think, in Jesus' ears, I'm sorry, I repent. But he did not. And it's here that, that we see Jesus instituting communion. Right, the Last Supper. You know, in John's gospel, it tells us that Judas actually left this meeting, and the rest of them sat, and Jesus really hosted this Passover meal. And it continues, verse 22, and as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them, and said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is... My blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Now, no doubt explaining to the disciples about the lambs, and Jesus would have talked about the bitter herbs that they had, and it was symbolizing the affliction of the slaves in and, and, and Egypt and how, how God set them free. But Jesus, he would have talked about the bread and, and, and the unleavened bread. Remember, it was a symbol. It was a symbol that they had to leave Egypt in haste. 
They, they, couldn't, they couldn't get, you know, the yeast, the leaven. They just had to leave quickly. And so Jesus would have talked about this, and, and, and Jesus would have passed the bread around. And it was supposed to be done in silence, you know, in quiet contemplation. But Jesus, he broke the silence. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Jesus, he, he took the, the, the Jewish Passover feast and he forever changed the significance. He changed it forever. And he says, now, guys, this speaks of my body given for you. And then Jesus passed the cup again. It was supposed to be done in silence and Jesus broke tradition again. He says, this is the, the, my blood, the blood of the new covenant. As often as you eat and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And so Jesus, he, he took this ancient Passover meal, and he took the two elements of it, the bread and the cup, and he told his disciples, from now on, from this point forward, it speaks of me. It speaks of me. And so I want you to partake, because I want you to remember me. I want you to remember me. You know, guys, communion is such an important part of the Christian life. Why? Now, for some people, it's just kind of an empty ritual. Just something they, you know, I, I, we, here at Calvary, we can do it anytime we want, but we do it about once a month. Because you know, I think sometimes if you, know, if you do it every week, it, it just becomes kind of this ritual. And so we want it to be special. We want it to be unique. And I, I believe the Lord intends it to be, to be something special you know, for you and I. A time we commune with him. And Jesus, I think he wanted the disciples to every time they partook of the bread and the cup to remember him, right? That's what he said. And, and, and he also wanted them to look back. They wanted, he, he wanted them to remember what he had done. And I, 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 I think this, I ask myself why. I think it's because as humans, we have a tendency to forget. We have a tendency to forget. Sometimes, who forgets names sometimes? <laughs> you know, who forgets uh, a meeting that you're supposed to be at? <laughs> who forgot where they put their keys? <laughs> or where they parked their car at Costco? <laughs> you're like, yeah, no, I know where it is. <laughs> you know. But um, anybody ever forget a birthday or anniversary? No. no. Don't answer that. See, I think God knows it's true. We forget. It just, we, I mean, we're, you know, we forget. I mean, sometimes we forget what we did yesterday <laughs> or last week. And God knows this is true of all of us. And so he sets up communion so that we'll never forget. We'll never forget what he did. That his body was torn apart that his blood was spilled, that he was separated from the Father, from his Father, and, 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 and you and I will, will, will never have to, every time we partake of communion, remember, um, we will remember what he did for us. And we'll be reminded of his goodness and his grace and his love. And so, we're going to partake in a moment, but I, but I want us to continue in the text. Because not just to look at what he did, but also, look what verse 25 says. Assuredly, I say to you that I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if you are made to stumble, yet I will not be. 
And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, and if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. And they all said likewise. See, going back to verse 25, not only should we look back as we partake of communion and remember what Jesus did, but we also need to look ahead. You know, Jesus, he told his, his disciples, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. And communion is not only helps us look back and remember what Jesus did, but also helps us look forward to the day when we will be with Jesus face to face in the Father's kingdom, in his Father's kingdom. You know, when his life, um, we look back at it, and, but we also look forward. You know, I think about all the trials and troubles that we have and hardships that we go through. But sometimes we focus on that, but guys, one day we're going to be with him in heaven. And, and, and I think the Lord wants us to look forward to that. To remember what he did, but also just re- remember, you know, not only that we have an opportunity to be in a relationship with him, we need to look ahead because we can get so focused sometimes on the here and now. We get so focused on, 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 on our issues and what we're going through and our problems and and. and, and when we do that, we start to strive and we start to rebel and we start to do our own thing. And, and you see, if we don't spend regular time at the table in, in communion with God, I think we have a greater chance, and really looking ahead, we have a greater chance of becoming like Judas and really Peter. You know, you see, Judas and Peter, they both focused on what they wanted. You know, they both focused on the here and the now only. And Judas realized, this guy, he's not going to rule and reign. He's going to die, and I don't, I'm going to get out of here while I can. <laughs> and Peter's thinking, well, my, my plan is still possible. If we fight, the kingdom of God is going to come. And, and both, in, in different ways, both betrayed him that night. You know, because they were focused on the right now. They were focused, not focused on eternity. They were not focused on heaven. But when we come to the table, when we come to the communion, we, we, we remember God loves us. I, we can trust him. And we have to remember that we're going to be in heaven someday. <laughs> and I don't have to be totally fulfilled now. I don't have to get it all together now, but, but, but my focus is, is, is on heaven. It's such an important lesson for us as we come to the communion table. It instituted right there in the upper room. And, and again, we're going to partake in a moment, but I want us to continue a little more. The second place to go is the Garden of Gethsemane, verse 32. And they came to the place which is called Gethsemane. And he said to the, his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him and began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. And he went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And then he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, you're sleeping. Could you not watch for one hour? <laughs> so Jesus and his disciples, this final night, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane means olive press. And, and so this garden is located on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. Um, today, as you walk down the Mount of Olives, you'll see... Uh, you'll see olive trees, um, and, and, and there's a little church there where they think, you know, Jesus was, but there's, there's other little gardens and olive trees along the slopes of the Mount of Olives. 
In the Gospel of Mark describes Jesus' distress in verse 30, 33. Remember Luke, um, or his distress, but in, in Luke, you remember he was a doctor, and he, he counts it that Jesus began to sweat blood at this time. And so Jesus was under a certain amount of emotional distress because he understood within hours he was going to go to the cross. Now, I, I, I don't believe that he was sweating blood and, and, and so distressed just because of the pain of the cross, though it was painful. You know, I, I think he was more stressed over the fact that he was becoming sin for you and I. I mean, he, he would take on the, the sin of the world. Imagine every disgusting action, every dis- disgusting attitude, it was, be, it was being put upon him. Him who knew no sin. I mean, he had never done anything wrong. He was perfect. He never had an impure thought, and yet within hours, he was becoming all of that for us. Second Corinthians 5.21 tells us that Jesus was going to bear the wrath of God. He was going to bear the wrath of God. For the first time in the history of the world, he would be separated from his Father. So what Jesus did was overwhelming. It was overwhelming to him, wasn't it? And so what did he do? What did he do when, when, when it was so overwhelming? He prayed. <laughs> he got down on his knees and prayed. What, what do you do when you're overwhelmed? You know, uh, when the world's falling apart, when you're stressed out, you know, some people turn to alcohol, some people turn to drugs or even pornography, or, you know, they just check out. You know, I remember this one time, when I was in my late 20s and I was just really stressed out. <laughs> I was just really stressed out. And so I, I left work early that day and I went to a matinee and I went and saw some action movie. It didn't matter what was playing. I just needed to kind of, ch- do you ever do this? You know, you just watch something. I was the only person in the movie theater. <laughs> and I was just, I just, I just checked out and, and got away from reality for a bit and it actually kind of helped a little. But... <laughs> You know, I, I just love Jesus' example. He, he went and prayed. I mean, really, that's what, it, that's what we need, right? We need to pray. I mean, that's where he found his strength. You know, the, it's like that, it's the most sobering reality is, is not found in, you know, any of those things that, that we try to do, but it's found when we pray. You know, it, it, the, 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 he fills us up and... and and, and, and Jesus, if he needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? <laughs> right? When we're stressed out, when life is overwhelming. Jesus even told his disciples that night, uh, in verse 38, uh, the text continues, it says, Watch and pray, <laughs> lest you enter temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them sleeping again. For their eyes were heavy as they did not know what to answer him. Jesus, I think he was trying to teach his disciples. I'm sure they were tired. I mean, they worked hard. But he was trying to teach his disciples one of the best things they could do to combat temptation was to pray was to spend time watching and praying. Watching and praying. You know, being aware. You know, watching speaks of having our eyes open. Think about it, you're watching what's going on. But they also need to be praying. And one of the biggest works of Jesus was still ahead of the cross, but before that great work, there was this battle in prayer. And that's where real battles are won, in prayer. Before you get to the battlefield, it's prayer. You know, Chuck Smith said, you, you, can do, 
you can do more than pray after you've prayed. (laughs) But you really can't do any more for God than pray until you've prayed. You can't really do any work or service for God apart from prayer. I think that's true. Guys, there's an enemy that, 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 that comes. We have an enemy, and he wants to tear our family apart. And, and there's a battle for, for souls. There's a battle for our community. There's a battle for our country. And I'm all for calling our Congress people. They don't seem to do a lot. <laughs> but you know, as Christians, we are called to pray and, and watch God work, you know, to do that. We don't fight this, this battle with carnal weapons, with guns or bombs, the enemy that we have. We fight this battle on our knees in prayer. And Jesus was showing us this. You know, the church, I think the church in America is weak because of this, because they don't take prayer seriously. We've lost that kind of idea how important prayer is. And, and I think sometimes, even as a country, we can be so self-sufficient and we, you know, we convinced ourselves that, that we've, we've kind of got it, we're under control. But, you know, God has not changed <laughs> from the days that, he, that, he, that the, the wind shook the upper room in the book of Acts. You know, God's not changed when, when he shut the mouths of lions, when he parted the Red Sea. And, and you know, when bread fell from heaven, God has not changed and... and I fear that we have changed. I mean, God, he can do great and mighty things. But sometimes I just don't think we believe that. Or we, don't, we certainly don't live that out. So watch and pray. Watch and pray. He says he calls, he calls us, even this morning, to be men and women who, who fight our battles on our knees in praying. And Jesus prayed, and even more importantly than he prayed, he, he prayed this, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. See, guys, the word of God is pretty clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through, except through me. Jesus said this. He said, I am the way, not a way. I am the way. And Jesus, you know, asked if there could be any other way. <laughs> he says, is there, is there any other way? And, 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 but then he said, not my will, but yours be done. Aren't you thankful that for that? Aren't you thankful that he didn't say, hey, you know what? <laughs> not my, but he did. He said, not my will, but yours be done. Verse 41, then he came to the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Is it enough? The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude of swords and clubs, came, and the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given him a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. And then they laid their hands on him and took him. Jesus, he's praying in the garden. He's been wrestling with God for God's will for his life. He's been wrestling with the the knowledge that he would be dying on the cross for our sins, and he's betrayed by the one that's close to him. Verse 47, Then one uh, of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out at against a a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. When Jesus told disciples not to resist, what was happening? They kind of freaked out. (laughs) They all took off. They all took off. And not only that, they scattered, they, they started fighting <laughs> with swords. And, I mean, guys, before we get too tough on the disciples, I, don't you think we would have done the same thing? 
Because if you don't watch and pray, if, if you and I don't pray, Lord, your will be done, we will flee like the disciples. Like the disciples, the moment circumstances in your life don't go as you expected them to go, you know, we f- fail, we start cutting off ears. <laughs> We make stupid decisions, is what was happening there. And, and we can forsake him. Well, I'll just do my own thing. So we have to watch and pray. Verse, a few more verses and I'll be done. Verse 51, it says, Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, and the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now, most Bible scholars believe this was actually the commentary of Mark himself. No no other gospel records this this little tidbit here, this particular event. Mark, we know he was a young man. We know his family had, had been involved in the early church. We know his mother apparently was one of the women who followed Jesus and helped in the ministry. And it suggested that the upper room, again, that was the family of Mark's, maybe his, his home in Jerusalem there. And what was Mark doing in his pajamas <laughs> in the garden? And, you know, perhaps, he, you know, perhaps as Judas went off to Gethsemane, you know, to find Jesus, Mark went with the crowd. Maybe he, was, he wanted to go warn Jesus. And when the soldiers tried to seize Mark, well, he fled naked. <laughs> so, Listen, as we come to the communion table, I, 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 Jesus, he wasn't going to avoid the cross. You know, his arrest wasn't because he was well defended. He, he, he hadn't... Guys, he, he died for us. He, he, he was going to the cross. He died for our sins. He paid for our sins. He paid the debt that, that he didn't owe because we owed a debt he couldn't pay. And that's the love of God. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross to pay for your sins. And God, he, he offers everybody this free gift of eternal life. You know, he offers you complete forgiveness to all your sins. And what do you have to do? All you have to do is repent. Turn from your sins. Agree with your sins. Agree that it's sin. (laughs) And realize your sins have separated you from God. And you must be willing to turn from your sins. You must believe that you must trust in Jesus to forgive you. You must open your heart to him. That's what he wants. Guys, as we come to the communion table, it's, it's simply a time, it's our Passover. <laughs> you know, it's, we remember that his body, the, the bread, that he, 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 you know, that his blood he shed for you. You know, communion is a time that, that we, that, that I encourage people to, to get right, get their hearts right with God. It's a time where we commune with him. It's a time where we just get right with him. It's so good to do that. He, he not, only, not only do we repent of our sins, but he cleanses us. He cleanses our hearts. And so communion is a time just between you and the Lord, and we invite you to the communion table, and we invite you to come and grab one of the communion cups. It has a cracker on one side and the juice on the other. And go back to your seat and just spend some time praying. And maybe repenting, or maybe just asking God to search your heart. And... As you do that, just spend time with the Lord. And maybe just even pray, Lord, not your will, not my will, but yours be done. <laughs> just pray that. And so when the worship team comes up, we'll invite them up, and um, we invite you to come down and, and grab. If you need gluten-free, it's on this side right here. So, Lord, we thank you so much for this time in your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can... We can celebrate communion, Lord. We thank you that, that you, you made this so simple for us that, 
that, that we can remember you. Lord, and it's, it's such a great picture. This bread is your body and the, the, the juice is your blood. And Lord, we, we, want to, we want to remember what you did for us on the cross. But we also, Lord, we look ahead to, to one day when we, we, were, we will partake with you in heaven. We'll remember. Lord, so we look, at, we look ahead, Lord, to that day. And so I just pray, Lord, that, that you would be ministering to us now, that your Holy Spirit would be doing a mighty work in our hearts and our lives, Lord. And we pray that simple prayer, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. In Jesus' name, amen. and forsaken I was shattered by the fall broken and forgotten feeling lost and all alone summoned by the king and to the master's courts lifted by the savior and cradled in his arms I was carried to the table Seated where I don't belong Carried to the table Swept away by His love And I don't see my brokenness anymore When I'm seated at the table of the Lord And carried to the table The table of the Lord Fighting thoughts of fear Wondering why he called my name Am I good enough to share this cup? This world has left me lame Even in my weakness The Savior called my name In his holy presence I'm healed and unashamed I'm carried to the table Seated where I don't belong I'm carried to the table Swept away by His love I don't see my brokenness anymore when I'm seated at the table of the Lord and carried to the table. are carried to the table, seated where we don't belong, we are carried to the table, swept away by His love. And we don't see our brokenness anymore When we're seated at the table of the Lord We're carried to the table The 
table of the Lord. You carry me, oh God. Carry me, oh God. You carry me, oh God. 